So we have a special guest today. One of the goals of this campaign is to support our down ballot candidates. And we have from Connecticut, Just Justin Paglino, who's running for Congress as the Green Party candidate in Connecticut. Hi, Justin. Hi, so how are you, Angela? About your campaign. Sure. Well, I am running for U.S. Congress, and I am an MD PhD. Um, I have um, recently uh, joined the Green Party after uh, losing a lot of um, faith in the Democratic Party, unfortunately, uh, and uh, come to believe that we really do need an independent left that votes left. Otherwise, the progressive wing of the Democratic Party just keeps getting taken for granted. So unless we uh, show show um, the party that we're willing to to vote independently and go somewhere with our vote. You know, I think our our policies will always be taken for granted. Uh, and uh, I also like to talk about ranked choice voting because I like to let people know that with uh, ranked choice voting, we could avoid the spoiler effect. We could have as many parties, as many independent candidates as anyone's interested in supporting, not have to worry about splitting the vote, throwing away votes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, one of the issues, my top issue that I'm really running on is Medicare for all. Uh, I believe healthcare is, a is, a is something that we all deserve. Uh, it's a moral imperative that we provide universal healthcare here in America. And, uh, there's really no excuse not to, because we can absolutely afford to, uh, most of the studies that have looked at the question uh, show that uh, it'll be less expensive. Let me just check, make sure everybody can hear me. Am I coming through on the audio? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So uh, Medicare for all is a policy that will save, uh, save money, uh, be up to 15% less expensive. But that expense would be a public expense instead of a private expense. Um, but there'd be no cost to the consumer out-of-pocket, premiums, deductibles, co-pays, all of that would be a thing of the past. And instead, we would have um, a, a public financing of, of, of health care. I personally favor a progressive income tax for just about everything that needs to be funded. Uh, and that's how I would prefer to see Medicare for All funded. Um, there are some, you know, there taxes such as the payroll tax are actually kind of a regressive tax that the one that we use to, to fund social security and so on. Anyway, um, so just to clarify, I am, I am running for U.S. Congress in Connecticut in the third congressional district, which is uh, New Haven and about 24 surrounding towns. It's the seat currently held by Rosa DeLauro, who's been office for, in office for 30 years. She's a Democrat. She does not support Medicare for all. Uh, the bill, Pramila Jaipal's bill, has been in Congress since February of 2019 and has not made it out of committee despite having 118 co-sponsors. And a lot of, and uh, my representative, Rosa Delora, she's not one of the co-sponsors, but I would be. So I'm doing this because, you know, if people want Medicare for all, they have to be able to vote for it. And I've heard, how I've heard you say, and I thought it was very true. It really resonated with me. If you want something, you have to vote for it. I almost feel like that has become the spirit of my campaign, my campaign slogan. If you want something, you have to vote for it because once you've voted, you've given up all your leverage. You can, you can vote for somebody. Uh, and if they say, you know, well, you know, we're not going to, I'm not going to do this right now, but maybe later, you know, they're never going to do it because once they've got your vote, they've really got everything they need out of you. And, uh, right. Yes. So, so if, yeah. So if you want, if you want something, you have to vote for it, you know, so people can vote for me now. I'm going to be on the ballot. It was very hard getting on the ballot. I appreciate all the work that, um, that people have been doing all across the country to get, uh, you guys, Howie and Angela on the ballot in different states because it's it is really um it's really not easy and i appreciate the volunteers that worked especially this year in terms of covid there's there's not a lot of outdoor gatherings happening where you can go up and talk to people um a lot of a lot of hours in parking lots <laughs> in in the hot summer heat 
uh, it has been very difficult. But I'm very passionate about what I'm doing. I'm real excited that I can give people the opportunity to vote for Medicare for all, for a, a ban on fracking, which is something I think we urgently need to do to uh, finally make a, some real impact on lowering our carbon emissions, uh, because the climate crisis is a real and serious threat. Uh, federal jobs guarantee, something else uh, that you know I'm, I'm really uh, believe in. You know, FDR put people to work. Make the federal government the employer of last resort, so to speak. Uh, you know, if people can't find a job in the private sector, there's lots of work to be done. Put people to work, you know, fixing our crumbling infrastructure, greening our infrastructure, building solar farms, building wind farms. There's lots of work that needs to be done that's going to be a win-win if we put people to work doing it. Um, so... I mean, that's that's where I am on a lot of the major issues. Well, also on war and peace, you know, I've been ever since, you know, the Iraq war uh, was a wake up call for for me and a lot of people that, you know, our foreign policy is out of control. You look into the history of it, it's been out of control for quite a while. We've really been involved in a lot more conflicts than we need to be. And I think a lot of them are motivated by economic interests, sad to say. And uh, so I advocate you know, demilitarizing our foreign policy and making peace the number one goal of our foreign policy. Uh, and and uh, I think we'll all benefit from that um, and we'll live in a more peaceful, stable world. So, you know, the Pentagon budget's out of control. It's up to $740 billion this year. Again, Rosa DeLauro, my representative, she voted for the $740 billion. She voted against the POCAN amendment, which was an amendment to the defense bill that would have cut spending by just 10%. But even that is too much of a cut um, for, for Representative DeLauro to, to stomach. So that, that amendment didn't pass. So there's a lot of money that we could be used, that we could be using to address Americans needs providing federal job guarantee, providing health care, um, increasing um, the minimum wage, providing universal pre-K, uh, providing free college. Uh, we could really be doing a better job providing for the American people and catering less to, to the special interests that are really guiding policy. Um, I don't know if... <clears throat> I don't know how this, I'm not familiar with this format. Do we have any questions coming in or do we know what? Yes, I'm actually looking in the chat. Um, there have, you're getting congratulations on running a tremendous campaign. Um, there's a couple oh. of folks lifting you up for that. Um, oh, I see now. Okay. I see. I was looking at the, uh, I was looking in the wrong column here. Okay. And Mabel, yeah, Mabel Clark is asking, do you support a ban on disposable plastics? Yeah, so plastics, we need to get away from plastic. I think about it all the time, you know, that I go to the store and I look for packaging. I look for products in packaging that I know I'm not going to have to worry about throwing away the plastic or, I mean, I try to recycle all the plastic I can, but we know that you know our our plastic recycling um, stream is backed up. China won't take our plastic anymore. You know, China about a year ago or so said, you know, we, we can't take any more of this plastic to recycle anymore. So yes, we need to do something to um, to to find alternatives to plastic. Maybe uh, um, you know, plant based alternatives. There's a lot more of these that are current technology uh, that that is a much better alternative for the environment because yet these plastics are problematic. They can carry chemicals in them because they're, they're, um, they're, plastic is hydrophobic and it can carry some hydrophobic chemicals in it uh, that can get actually into the food stream. It can be concentrated in the food stream. And, um, you know, plastic breaks down in the, microplastics gets into the ocean, it's eaten by the fish and so on and so on. And things get concentrated on and up the food stream to the point where um, we're not sure what we're being exposed to, but 
you look at um, in people's bloodstreams, you know, the study, some studies that have been done, you can find all kinds of strange chemicals and plastics at low levels in people's in people's bodies because of it's making its way into our food supply. And that's just very, very concerning. And so I mean, that's just one example of what happens if you let special interests kind of um, dictate policy in Washington. There's money to be made by polluting. And, you know, unless the people speak up and say, we, we don't want these pol pollutants in our food supply, uh, that's, that's what's going to happen. Um, so, yes, we need to do everything we can to reduce um, the accumulation of plastics. You know, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch out in the, is swirling around out there in the middle of the Pacific. It's, um, it, it's I think, the size of Texas, if I'm not mistaken, something on that order. Um, like, I come from a medical and science background. I'm an MD. I'm a PhD. I did virology research in a lab for... 15 years. My approach, my, my approach to um, public policy is we have to come at everything from a science, we have to come at questions from a science perspective. That if there's something we don't know, we have to go to the experts and ask, you know, what's, what's the best answer the science has to offer us right now? Uh, so in terms of, um, you know, reducing pollutants, what are the most harmful pollutants? How can we reduce them? What are the alternatives? We've done this before with, uh, you know, acid rain or uh, the CFCs that were putting a hole in the ozone layer. You, we banned CFCs and we fixed the problem. We got to do the same thing with carbon di carbon dioxide and methane emissions that are causing the climate crisis. We have to, you know, believe in science. It's it's got a lot to offer us if we we'll <laughs> if we only listen and take it seriously. Okay, R Rocky Justiano, Ricky Justi, Justiniano. He asks, is it possible to maintain a private option in Medicare for all? A private option? Well, it's, uh, that's an interesting question. I'm not sure exactly what he means by that. I guess the option of buying private insurance. Um, the hope is, the idea is with Medicare for all, that it would be so comprehensive that there would be little to no need to buy any kind of supplemental insurance. I understand right now with Medicare as it exists, people often need to buy supplemental insurance. And some people I've talked to, there's a misunderstanding. They think Medicare for all will just take the existing Medicare program and expand it to everybody. But actually it's more than that, right? It's, it's actually um, expanding, making full comprehensive benefits available to everybody free at the point of service uh, so that they're, you know, including vision, including hearing, uh, including dental, including prescription drugs. So there really shouldn't be a need for additional um, private insurance. I suppose if uh, I, I, I suppose if people wanted to to purchase some, you know, someone could try to sell it, but I don't think they'd have many customers. if we do a good job providing, you know, public health insurance. Margaret Elizabeth, hey, Margaret. They're asking, since there is currently no federal ban on non-consensual surgery on intersex children, would you support an effort to prohibit these surgeries on a federal level? No ban, uh, no federal ban on non-consensual surgery mm -hmm. on intersexual, intersex children. Mm -hmm. This is this is a difficult issue. I think that um, you know I'm a parent, and uh, you know I I I think there's a lot there is a lot to be said for the idea of um, you know letting letting the biology of children stay in place um, when they are born. The federal, currently no federal ban on non-consensual surgery. I mean, I would, I would consider it. I would consider it. I think I'd have to, I honestly, I'd have to learn more about it. I'd have to educate myself a little bit more about it. I know that there are, um, it's, it's impossible for a child to give consent. And I'm a parent. I know that 
you know, my child had surgery and I gave consent when they when he had ear tubes put in. Of course, that's a very different, less um, life altering surgery than the kind of uh, surgeries you're talking about on people's, you know, reproductive organs and so forth. So, you know, I, I'm, but I would like to hear people's perspectives on, you know, uh, the case for a ban. I'd be very open to hearing the case for a ban and, and, you know, I, I can imagine that there's a good chance it would make sense to me. I just have to apologize. I'm not completely familiar. And I don't want to say one way or the other without having heard the, all the specifics. Javard Parker is asking, does the Green Party recommend the 13th be a 13th Amendment be amended to fully outlaw slavery and in prison labor for low wages? I, I'm all for that. I can't speak for the Green Party as a whole, but I know that sounds like it makes a lot of sense to me. I know there are prison, there's prison labor in California where they're out fighting wildfires for a dollar an hour and, and ridiculous wages like that. And um, they're putting their lives at risk. And so, um, you know, and I, and then there's the issue of, of territories and there's many citizens like in Samoa and um, where, where I, a lot of the same protections that we enjoy in the States don't necessarily extend to them. And, uh, I think we have to always remember them in our considerations too when we're talking about what our rights are. Let's remember that the U.S. has a lot of territories from our colonial past. Uh, we held on to the Philippines for a good 50 years after taking it from Spain in a war and then fighting the Philippines to, to hold on, the Filipinos to hold on to it. But <clears throat> yes, absolutely. I think uh, if, if, a Congress, if an amendment to the Constitution is necessary to do that, then I'd be in favor of that. Richard Pink asks, what is your take on this year's flu vaccine? And would you agree to be vaccinated by the first COVID-19 vaccine promoted <laughs> by the Trump administration? You know, I, you know, coming from a science background, it's really been sad to see what's happened with, with Trump misrepresenting the science. Um, and, and, and trying to sideline Dr. Anthony Fauci and trying to put in his lackeys at the FDA um, and, and really misguide people and misrepresent the science. Um, and so it's sad because it's, you know, people need to have faith in these public institutions that they're really looking out for the public health and the public interest and, and uh, they've worked the people in these agencies have worked hard for years and they're highly trained, but when the white house comes in and strong arms them and puts in somebody at the top, who's going to follow, you know, tow the, the administration's line, uh, it, it, it destroys credibility. Unfortunately, it, it, it shakes people's faith in the, in, you know, can we believe what the FDA is saying anymore? Can we even trust the CDC anymore? And it's sad. Uh, because we know now that there's a political pressure being put on them. So we have to, you know, if there's a way to reduce pol political pressure from being um, applied on these agencies to make it less less possible to do that, I'd be interested in that kind of idea. But in terms of the vaccines, you know, they should be fully tested. A vaccine that hasn't gone through phase three trials, I wouldn't want to take. I'd be scared to take that. I mean, we need a vaccine desperately, but there's an important, it's very important to go through phase three trials to really get an idea of if there are serious side effects uh, to a vaccine that you want to make sure that it's safe. And you can't, you can't assume that. That's what you, what you find out by doing trials. Um, so in terms of the flu vaccine, I'm not familiar with the flu vaccine uh, yet that, that's coming out this year. I get the flu vaccine every year. I know there's a small risk associated with it, but I take it in part to protect the public health because I don't want to be a vector that transmits influenza um, to, to a vulnerable person.
Aaron Hernandez Burleson is asking, what do you have to say about the movement to end the 40 hour work week? Well, I, I'm not familiar with that, that movement. I know that the 40 hour work week is something that was won by the uh, labor movement over many years and, and, and decades. So I assume that I imagine, I can only imagine this is a movement to extend the work week is that correct to make to do away with the, the 40 hour limitation on the work week? Uh, if so, I, I would I would be opposed to that. Um, I can't. I think it's the other way around. People oh, want really? a reduction in oh. the normal work week, usually with the maintenance of the pay. Yes. And then the okay. question is, how do you make sure that pay is maintained? And if you put it on every business, they have different capacities to keep the pay. So you get, you know, 30 hours work for 40 hours pay, um, which then brings up proposals to have uh, a public system that sends a second check to people so that the productivity gains, which have now been taken by the capitalists are socially distributed because it's the workers that are, you know, doing the work that increases the productivity. So, uh, there's a guy named Andre Gortz in Europe had a lot of proposals for that in the eighties and nineties and it's kind of receded, but, uh, I think it's something we need to go back and look at. And I certainly support that because if you look at the charts, wages and productivity rose in tandem until about 1970 from the end of world war II. And since then wages have been stagnant and productivity's continued on its upward bound. And that difference between what we produce, and the labor we do has been taken by the owners of uh, the enterprises. So we're so productive now. People say we could we could get produce what we need, say in thirty hours of, with thirty hour work weeks, and then to maintain people's income, we need some kind of social program to distribute those productivity grains that don't go to the workers now. So that's that's what people talk about and. Um, there hasn't been a focused movement. You know, the movement now is more to get the minimum wage up. You know, 15 yeah. is popular. We're calling for 20 in our campaign. Yeah, well, when I, whenever I talk about economics, I like to start by saying, you know, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. And that's an old piece of wisdom that people seem to have forgotten. You know, unless you do something about it, unless you do something, that's what happens. The rich will keep on getting richer and the poor will keep on getting poorer. Because when you have advantages, they compound. And when you have disadvantages, they compound. So I view it as the role of the government to do something about that. And uh, that includes whether it be not just a safety net, but maybe a, a universal basic income. Um, and of course, progressive taxation. Uh, you know, this, there's these ra this radical idea that taxation is theft has become, you know, popular, at least in the Libertarian Party. And but it's Ever since Reagan, um, you know, this idea that that you know there's something evil about taxation is is, is problematic um, because I I do believe there, quite frankly, there is a redistributive responsibility that governments have um, because in the absence of that, you end up you will end up with stratif stratified society and with a concentrated powerful elite. All right. All right. Um, seeing any more questions being pitched your way. Thank you. And I've been reading the chat and people have been very supportive of you. Um, Miss Ebell particularly appreciates um, the fact that you were very human about your answer um, and willing to, you know, admit, hey, let me research this. People want authenticity. And so, you know, you you get in high marks for that. Oh, um, I appreciate that. Yeah, I, I think it's, I, what I've seen is pretty dope. So um, let the folks know how to find you. Yeah, so my website is justinforall.org, like justinforall.org. And uh, I have, you can email me at info at justinforall.org. There it is. Uh, I also have a Facebook page, Justin for, for All. And um, Twitter, Justin for all too. Justin for all without the two was already taken, and I couldn't get it. 
So it's Justin for all too. <laughs> well, uh, yeah. so I'm, looking, I'm looking for support. I'd love to hear from anybody. Well, thanks for coming on. I know Rosa Delora. I've been reading about her in Congress and some of the liberal groups are promoting her as a, you know, a progressive, but as you point out, she won't vote to cut the military. She won't be for Medicare for all. And, uh, you know, I wish you all the luck and I hope you, you can, you know, be the first green member of Congress in the United States. Woohoo! Canada's done it. The UK's done it. You know, it's our turn to get up in there. You know, even with the winner take all system, you know, we're in all the states where there's parliament, you know, countries where there's proportional representation. But uh, we can still we can still get some people up in there. Well, thank you, Howie. I appreciate it. Yeah, proportional representation, ranked choice voting, I think are going to be real game changers to have ranked choice voting in Maine this year. And I'm hoping it's going to become more and more popular. People are going to understand we don't have to live like this. We don't have to live with a spoiler effect. We can have a, a much more wide open democracy that's open to, to any number of parties and independents and different viewpoints. Yes, sir. Thank you for being with us tonight. You know, you're getting a lot of love in the chat. So thank you for taking your time and, and letting the folks know who you are. So it's pretty awesome. Thank you, guys. It's really a pleasure. Mm -hmm.